You're listening to the Anesthesia Patient Safety Podcast, the official podcast of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. We're bringing you the very best from the APSF newsletter and website, as well as the latest information in perioperative patient safety. Thanks for joining us. Anesthesia Patient Safety Podcast. My name is Allie Bechtel, and I'm your host. Thank you for joining us for another show. We are returning to the APSF resources today and the external ventricular drain safety campaign. Question. What type of EVD is recommended to reduce the risk of EVD-associated ventriculitis? Answer. An antimicrobial EVD. Check out the EVD educational document for a picture of this catheter device. Before we dive into the episode today, we'd like to recognize Nihon Koden, a major corporate supporter of APSF. Nihon Koden has generously provided unrestricted support to further our vision that no one shall be harmed by anesthesia care. Thank you, Nihon Koden. We wouldn't be able to do all that we do without you. Our featured topic again today is the External Ventricular Drain Safety Campaign, a global patient safety initiative which represents a collaboration between the APSF and the Society for Neuroscience and Anesthesiology and Critical Care. To follow along with us, head over to APSF.org and click on the Patient Safety Resources heading. Then, the seventh one down is External Ventricular Drain Safety Campaign. I will include a link in the show notes as well. We are going to dive a little bit further into the EVD safety campaign today. Let's start with increasing our knowledge base. To follow along with us, go ahead and click on the EVD educational document. There are high-quality labeled pictures to help highlight how to use these devices correctly and safely. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the indications and complications. Today, let's start with device setup. Here are the recommendations. The EVD system should be set up by personnel familiar with the device who have demonstrated appropriate clinical competency. Devices should be set up observing standards of sterile technique. Only flushless transducer systems are used. The EVD system is primed with sterile, preservative-free saline. The setting should be expressed in centimeters of water. And leveling of the EVD should always be made at the external auditory meatus. Next up, how do you level an EVD? First, connect the ventricular or lumbar catheter with sterile technique. Attach the pressure cable to a flushless transducer. Turn the stopcock off to the patient by turning it to the 3 o'clock position. Open the system to air by removing the red cap. Press 0 on the monitor. And then when the monitor indicates 0, return the stopcock upright and replace the injection cap. Caution ahead! Make sure that you do not connect the EVD or a lumbar drain to a high-pressure system, such as a pressure bag that you would use for an arterial line or central line. For patient preparation prior to EVD placement, here are the steps that you want to take. Follow ASRA guidelines for lumbar drain placement and the Neurocritical Care Society guidelines for EVD placement for prompt coagulopathy screening and reversal prior to EVD or lumbar drain placement and maintenance. Administer antibiotics only prior to placement of EVD or lumbar drain and follow institutional antibiotic algorithms in selecting the antibiotics. Whenever possible, use antimicrobial impregnated EVDs and make sure that you practice strict aseptic techniques based on national and institutional guidelines. 
Here are several preoperative considerations to keep in mind as well. These are important details to include as part of a complete preoperative handoff between the intensive care team and the anesthesia team. A focused history and neurological examination. The CSF color and consistency. Is it hemorrhagic or xanthochromic or tea colored? Hourly CSF output with a maximum of about 20 mLs an hour. Review of the ICP values, ICP waveform analysis, ICP trends, autoregulation indices, cerebral perfusion pressure, and other multimodal monitoring data as appropriate, and clinical and radiological evidence of clamping trial tolerance. We mentioned the ICP waveform. This can be monitored with an EVD, and it is important to understand what you are looking at. The first wave, P1, is the percussion wave due to reflections off the choroid plexus. The second wave, P2, is the tidal wave, which reflects brain compliance, and normally the P2 wave is 80% of the P1 wave. If you see that the P2 wave is taller than the P1 wave, this means that there is reduced cerebral compliance. Finally, the dichrotic wave reflects aortic valve closure. Before the patient is brought down from the ICU, here are some important considerations as part of the pre-transport screening questionnaire. Is the EVD continuously draining in the neuro ICU? or is it clamped for drainage? What is the hourly CSF drainage? What was the CSF output over the past 24 hours? Was an EVD clamp trial conducted in the ICU? What were the results of the clamping trial? What is the baseline ICP? Is it in the range of less than 15 millimeters of mercury, between 15 to 19, or greater than 20? What is the reason for transporting the patient to the anesthesia suite? Is this for a diagnostic or therapeutic procedure? There are two options for managing the EVD during transport. Option one is to travel with the EVD clamped. Option two is to travel with the EVD open and draining CSF. It is important to continue monitoring during transport. Continue all pre-transport monitoring and documentation, which may include the end tidal carbon dioxide, mean and systolic arterial pressures, intracranial pressure, and brain tissue oxygenation, and the cerebral perfusion pressure. Use a dedicated intravenous pole to mount the EVD or lumbar drain. Transport personnel must be prepared to treat intracranial hypertension during intrahospital transport. And it is important to individualize decision making to transport with the EVD open or closed to CSF drainage, depending on the patient. Phew, we made it to the operating room. We need to continue our vigilant monitoring to keep our patients with an EVD safe. In the operating room, it is important to document the following in the anesthetic record at least every hour or more frequently as the situation demands. Pressure, and this may include the ICP and cerebral perfusion pressure, or the intraspinal pressure and the spinal cord perfusion pressure. The amount of CSF drainage expressed in milliliters. The color of the CSF and any change in the color of the CSF observed during the procedure. The drain height relative to the reference level. And the EVD or lumbar drain status as determined by the stopcocks in the device. Is it open or clamped? Incorporate all that information pertinent to EVD and the lumbar drain into a standardized interoperative handoff between anesthesia providers. Anesthesia professionals are good at troubleshooting in many different situations. Here are several considerations for EVD troubleshooting. It is important to promptly recognize any accidental intrathecal injection, 
But lavage of the intrathecal space after inadvertent intrathecal injection is not recommended. Routine flushing of the EVD should not be performed. EVD tubing that is accidentally disconnected should be clamped immediately. If the EVD system is contaminated by disconnection, all distal parts should be replaced with new sterile tubing. You must remain vigilant for any of these critical changes. Sudden change in color of CSF, sudden drainage of CSF of 15 to 20 mLs, the EVD or lumbar drain suddenly stops draining, or a dampening of the ICP waveform. This is the time to alert the neurosurgeon immediately and if you are being supervised to inform your attending. The educational document has a perioperative checklist at the end. It includes all of the information that we just went through in a tidy checklist. This is a great resource to print out and have on hand any time that you are providing care for a patient with an EVD or a lumbar drain. Now we are going to look a little closer at the EVD policy and procedure template. This is an evidence-based document that you can use to implement best practices at your institution. Go ahead and click on the PDF link from the resource page and scroll down until you get to EVD maintenance. This section is really important for anesthesia professionals who are providing anesthesia care for patients with an EVD to understand how the EVD is maintained in the ICU prior to transport to theater and afterwards. Here we go. Number one, monitoring for signs and symptoms associated with changing ICP, which may include decreased level of consciousness, nausea, vomiting, headache, lethargy, or agitation. Neurological assessment should be performed and documented hourly or more frequently as the clinical situation warrants. Number two, hourly assessment includes CSF drainage, color, and clarity. Number three, measure the ICP every hour. Notify the physician immediately if the ICP exceeds established parameters. If no parameter is specified, notify the physician if the ICP is greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. Keep the head of bed elevated 30 degrees unless otherwise ordered. Check the patient's position to ensure the transducer is at the ordered reference level. If a patient is very active and moving around in the bed, then it is imperative to frequently assess that the drain is leveled appropriately to prevent over or under drainage. We're on to number six now, which is to verify neurocritical care primary team orders for drain height every shift and drainage parameters if indicated, and this may be in milliliters per hour. Verify the correct placement of the drainage chamber every one to two hours and with every position change. Make sure that that cylinder is in an upright position at all times. Ensure that the system is appropriately clamped or open depending on the patient situation and physician order. Assessment of the drainage system should be done at a minimum of every four hours. This includes inspecting the EVD from the insertion site along with the entire drainage system, checking for cracks in the system or fluid leaking from the insertion site. Check the EVD for patency as needed by lowering the entire system for a brief moment to assess drip rate into the graduated burette. Waveform assessment should be ongoing with special attention noted to P1, P2, and P3 components. Be aware of any changes in the waveform and troubleshoot when warranted. Document the ICP waveform assessment once a shift and as waveform changes occur. Perform waveform analysis upon initial assessment of the patient and system, establishing a baseline to use for comparison throughout the shift. Observe the ICP in relation to other hemodynamic parameters, such as the mean arterial blood pressure, which will give an indicator of the cerebral perfusion pressure. If the EVD is used for continuous drainage, clamp momentarily for changes in position and suction. 
We're up to number 15 now, which is after patient activity that required clamping is completed, make sure that the clamp is open at the pre-ordered level and the head of bed is returned to the previous position. The transducer must be re-zeroed after a shift and at least every 12 hours as a troubleshooting technique or when the interface with the monitor has been interrupted. Use of mechanical VTE prophylaxis, either with sequential compression device or intermittent pneumatic compression in all patients with contraindications to pharmacological prophylaxis and without contraindications to mechanical devices. In patients with additional risk factors for VTE, this may include, but is not limited to, concurrent malignancy, trauma, spinal cord injury, critical illness, and immobilization, suggest pharmacological prophylaxis after an intracranial hemorrhage has been ruled out or is stable. And finally, avoid routinely changing catheter sites. As you can see, a lot of work goes into keeping patients with an EVD safe in the ICU. And it is imperative that anesthesia professionals remain vigilant in the operating room to keep patients with an EVD safe as well. Another important way to keep patients safe is to gather more information, and we have resources so that you can collect data on quality and safety regarding EVDs. SNAC has created a list of electronic clinical quality metrics that you can start implementing at your hospital. These metrics are based on the evidence-based recommendations. Check it out on the EVD Safety Campaign page or in the show notes. The EVD Safety Campaign provides the foundation for an education session that you can go through on your own or invite a few colleagues and review these materials with your perioperative team or anesthesia department. With this APSF resource, all you need to do is bring the coffee. If you have any questions or comments from today's show, please email us at podcast at APSF.org. Please keep in mind that the information in this show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute medical or legal advice. We hope that you will visit APSF.org for detailed information and check out the show notes for links to all the topics we discussed today. Until next time. Stay vigilant so that no one shall be harmed by anesthesia care.